what is NEST? What is NEST is an interactive program that is seeking answers, relevant answers to contemporary challenges confronting us as a people. Now, one area that is very key when it comes to national development, when it comes to national growth, is issue of peace and security. It's an area that we cannot and we should not joke with. In fact, there are other sister Africa countries, though we don't have enough, but they've wasted away opportunities through civil wars, violence, and unnecessary tensions. This afternoon, I have with me on this platform, what is next? A man who has become a symbol of peace and national security in this country. And this evening, we want him to help us. What we need to do together as a people to sustain the peace we have, and if possible, even to broaden the scope of peace and national security. The man who is now a symbol of peace and security in this country, Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Kweku Asante. Prof, you are welcome to What is Next. Thank you, my brother. Viewers, I want mm. Professor Asante to help us. Who is this man? He's been a bishop Kumasi, Methodist Diocese. He's been a former presiding bishop, Methodist Church, Christian Council Chairman. He's been President Trinity Theological Seminary. Elsewhere, they will say Vice Chancellor. He's been a former head of department, KNUST Department of Religious Studies. He's a family man, and at the moment, he is the Chairman of National Peace Council. Prof. Help us to understand the man behind Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. Were you born into a family of pastors, a family of intellectuals? Were you born with a golden spool in your mouth? Thank you very much, um, my, my brother, Dr. Opuni. No, um, Reverend Emmanuel Asante was not born um, with a golden spoon in his mouth. He wasn't born in any... Um, in a family of um, intellectuals, neither was he, was he born um, into any kind of rich family. As a matter of fact, I, um, I am the tenth born of my father, who was uh, um, a sub-chief in, um, in Tonsu, a Jasehine of Tonsu. Um, he's, um, I call him the late Nana Kofiapia now. My mother, um, the late Adjoa Kunama Alayas, Adjoa Frimu, was also um, from Ejura. Um, the third born of my mother and the tenth born of my father. And as you can see, my, my father was a polygamist. Um, so when I was growing up, my mom and dad were not married, but I shared my life between them. In fact, the greater part with my mother and my uncles. So I grew up at Ijra and, and later Kumasi. I spent a few years here in Accra with an uncle. And, and then from Kumasi, I, I took off, um, left for um, London and then to Canada. Spent about 10 years outside where I studied and then came back as a Methodist minister. Prof, you are such a person that any young pastor, any young scholar mm. will want to follow your example. Everybody wants to attain some of the heights, mm. uh, the heights you have. What are the values that have shaped you, mm. whether in terms of ministry or in terms of academics? Are, are, are there real values that you cherish that you don't want to give away? Well, I think the, the, my values, um, if anything, first of all, would be um, my upbringing. When I was growing up um, in elementary school, it was at a time when the Young Pioneer Movement was in place in Ghana. And apart from some of the negative things people said about the Young Pioneer Movement, I gained a lot from the Young Pioneer. I was a Young Pioneer, grew up to become a leader. Uh, within the Young Pioneer Movement. It taught me um, 
if you like, nationalism in the right sense of the word. You know, I became somebody who loved the country. It taught me I belong to a group within the Young Pioneer that is called the Katra Group. So I learned drumming and dancing. And to be honest with you, I used to play, um, you know, one of the drums in a in a, in a, in a, a, a dance thing that they call Denseu, which was a form of kete. Mm. Um, and, and, and I used to dance too. But apart from that, I also learned about the nationalist movement. You know, I was made to memorize a lot of speeches of Kwame Nkrumah and of other African leaders, and we um, displayed this in public, where you will be acting like Modibo Keita, you will be acting like um, some of the African leaders at the time. That instilled in me patriotism, the love for the country. But apart from that, I also became a Christian early in my life through the scripture union. Mm -hmm. And the people I came into contact with were educated, very, very, very educated Christians. At that time, I thought that, you know, educated people were people who would not bother themselves with Christianity. But these were scholars. I mean, I would say people who were teaching in, in universities and those who had, you know, attained university degrees and loved the Lord. And they became my friends. And I cultivated the desire to be like them, to be a Christian, but also to be not an ignorant Christian, Christian who would also take to studies. So I studied at the uh, you know, Christian Service um, College, now the Christian Service University College, had opportunity to go abroad to study in London Bible College, now London School of Theology, and then Ottawa University, where by the grace of God and dint of hard work, I earned my PhD and, and came home. You know, some of the values that I learned, um, uh, cultural values, um, nationalistic values, and if you like, Christian values, these combine to make Emmanuel Asante who he is. I think some of these mentors that you want to acknowledge, maybe mentioning their names and what they represented. Let me, let me acknowledge, you know, people like Dr. Jani, um, uh, Dr. Suji, I think is late Dr. Suji. Some of them, most of them were um, lecturers at the KNUST at the time who really influenced my life. I must also mention the names like the late Isaac Abbey Bio. Um, um, in terms of the woman, Florence Yaboa, um, Madame Florence Yaboa, and many, many, many others whose names I, I will not okay. be able to mention now. Kwesi Banfo, um, Reverend Kwesi Banfo, and others who really challenged my life and built my Christian commitment and my Christian faith. So you had growing up a spirituality that also uh, uh, brought you into academics. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we handle our young people today? Spirituality is gradually becoming, if you know how to blow in tongues or to, and prophesy, and mm -hmm. you know, and some of our young people, even in university campuses, mm -hmm. sometimes feel that they can throw away their books and be more prayerful. Mm -hmm. So how, you have that kind of balanced spirituality, mm -hmm. patriotism, it's in academic, in, it's in sound, biblical, you know, mm -hmm. as, as, as experiences and all that, very balanced. Mm -hmm. How do we get our young people, today's young people, to such levels? I think it is important for us to understand that the, um, the gospel that the Lord has entrusted into our hands as Christians is a holistic one. The human being is not just a spiritual reality, but what in theology we would say, a human being is a psychosomatic reality. He is a body-soul being. And therefore, our spirituality must be holistic. And holistic spirituality means that you do not just educate your heart, you also educate your mind. You know, so our Christianity must not be one of an obscurantist type of Christianity, a Christianity that it's um, not really um, pretend ignorant in terms of what is happening in, in, in the world. I believe that my Christianity should throw me out there to be able to bring Christian perspectives on issues that 
what's happening in the world. And so um, you having been my colleague knows that my interest is in the area of church and society, looking at the Christian perspective on issues, Christian perspective on economics, Christian perspectives on politics, Christian perspectives on every aspect of uh, human life. Because I do believe that the Bible has a value on that. When we talk about development, what kind of development are we talking about? Development has a holistic dimension to it, and uh, Christians should be in a position to do that. So to the young people um, who have taken Christianity, let me tell you that any serious commitment to Christianity will also help you to understand that you are the light of this world in terms of one who has the capacity to eliminate the minds of other people and also the salt of this world. And that, that means that we should not be ignorant. We should learn hard so that we will be able to communicate the Christian values through you know, um, education to other people as well. Viewers, I'm in conversation with Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. We are discussing his early beginnings. And when we come back, He's told us that growing up, he was exposed to the then young pioneer, that was CPP. I have heard somewhere, once upon a time, that he was NDC. There was another time I heard the same person uh, as MPP. Today, I will want him to answer that question, whether he's CPP, NDC, MPP, and, and any other. Mm. Just wait for us, if you can. We'll be back in a very short time. back to what is next and i'm in conversation with most reverend professor emmanuel sante uh, the man of many many uh, different parts he is a scholar a professor university professor former president trinity theological seminary in methodist church a former bishop kumasi diocese presiding bishop interfaith ecumenical front he's been a former chairman christian council of ghana and at the moment, he holds this country, uh, a, a very key uh, 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 area, holding the country together in matters of peace and security, engaging uh, different faith, Christian, Muslim, traditional leaders, engaging various political parties. This is a man, anytime there's a challenge anywhere, everybody will want to call, but where is National Peace Council? But today, I want him to resolve this issue for us. Prof, are you... A CPP, NDC, MPP. Who are you? I'm a Ghanaian patriot. And uh, that's, that's the first thing that I would like to say. I think it is important for people to understand that you cannot define Ghanaians in terms of political parties. As I have told you, my upbringing, my commitment to the Young Pioneer Movement taught me to be patriotic. So if there is a party that I belong to, Ghana, and for that matter, anybody who pursues policies that will be of interest to this nation, I stand with that person. Any policy that is inimical to Ghana, I hate it. And the reason why a lot of people will identify me with various political parties is, is that it is difficult for, for you to say that this is where he stands. You know, um, what happened? The year 2012 was the time that I became the um, the chairman of the you know National Peace Council, and at that time, you know that there was a um, a stalemate in respect of our election, and it became necessary for us to bring the two parties together to be able to jaw jaw 
and to solve the problems they were encountering as a result of the elections. In fact, it, it was through the Peace Council's instrumentality that the two political, major political parties were brought together, together with the Electoral Commission, to try to see whether we'll be able to find a solution to the stalemate. Because at that time, the MPP was not ready to accept the outcome of the election, even before it was announced. So we met and said that, let us discuss this. Do they have a problem? If they have a problem, how do we deal with it? And I had the, I should say, unpleasant duty of chairing the meeting at that time. This meeting was not even open to the public. And after the discussion, we came out there. It, it's, we reached a stage where we were not able to find, uh, you know, solution to the problem. So they asked. And we said that we have advice that after the announcement, any aggrieved party can take action. They can seek justice through the courts. In fact, it wasn't my idea. It was something that was said there. But when I came out, the press asked, and we said that this is where we have reached. And we said that those who are not happy with it can seek redress through the courts. And of course, I mean, if you're not happy, you seek redress through the courts. You don't fight. You don't take cutlass. You, did, you don't take, you know, gadgets to, 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 to hurt one another. But we go through justice, the laws according to the land. And this was how some people interpreted it. He says the man who could have stopped the elections says that they should go to the courts. I do not have, I didn't have authority then, and I don't have authority now to control the elections of this country. The constitution of this country says that it is the electoral commission that has the power and the authority to control this. And then as usual i happened i had become the, the 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 chairman of the of the peace council nominated by the um uh, christian council but because they had maybe the chairman people out there didn't know even how people within the uh, the uh, the um peace council are nominated and brought into the peace council so they assumed that my position was a political appointment and since ndc was in power and I had become the chairman, then automatically, I mean, I belong to the NDC. And people said whatever they wanted to say. You know that recently they are saying that I'm MPP because um, President Mahama had said something and I had said that he should apologize to the nation. Because of that, I'm, I'm MPP. But for me, I'm not bothered about whether I belong to here or there. The mere fact that I, I vote means that I have people that I vote for. But I'm not going to sit here and say I vote for left or right. My position will not allow me to say that. But I just want to say to Ghanaians that I do not, I'm not you know, committed to political parties. I'm committed to the nation Ghana. I want the peace of this nation. And any person who is there to promote the well-being and the welfare of Ghanaians, any policy that any party or any government brings into being that will push Ghanaians forward, I am also for it. Mm. Prof, any time we have a challenge, mm. violence in this country, uh, almost all the media houses, what you hear, where is National Peace Council? What is the significance of the National Peace Council as far as our national cohesion is concerned? And why is it that people call National Peace Council only when we have a seemingly violent tension and a good day, we don't really don't hear where is National Peace Council? Well, you know, the, perhaps we need to educate the public in respect of the institution, how the Peace Council was instituted in the first place. Um, the Peace Council started off, if you like, as a concern, as, as, as an NGO, a group of people who were very much concerned about the well welfare of, of the situation. It started off in the north because of the tensions and the fights and all that. Some people came together and said that, why don't we judge or bring people together to talk and to discuss such issues? During the time of President Kofo, he saw the importance of the whole thing and gave them the kind of support that they need. And the Peace Council on the quiet at that time did a lot of things with the UNDP, you know, supporting the whole thing. 
Now, as a result of that, they, it became necessary that why don't you make this Peace Council a statutory body? And so with the help of the UNDP and others, the peace architecture was drawn. The thing was taken to parliament. And I'm told that it is the only thing where all the political parties, uh, representatives, parliamentarians, agreed that there was no dissension when it came to accepting it. So an act was drawn for the Peace Council to be there. The objective of the Peace Council is to try as much as possible to bring feuding parties together to Georgia because we believe that Georgia Georgia in is better than war warring. I mean, fighting doesn't bring anybody anything. So our objective is not to stand for the government or for the opposition or for any particular person, but for the interest of Ghana to make sure that when there is tension, people can come together and talk about it. And if there is the need even to take action, let's use under the rule of law, the law, to try to solve problems rather than us fighting and, and killing ourselves. That's how the Peace Council came to be, and that is how the Peace Council has functioned. Unfortunately, people can see the, the role of the Peace Council in terms of what they need to do. You will be amazed to know that even when people are fighting, domestic fights, somebody is fighting his own wife. We have had situations where people have called us about domestic problems because there is, they've talked about Peace Council. Issues that should be addressed even by the Electoral Commission. They say Peace Council. Issues that should be addressed by Shiraj. Peace Council. Issues that should go to the court. They say Peace Council. You know. And so, <laughs> for me, it is, it is a good sign that you know, people know, see the value, the importance of the National Peace Council in trying to solve the problems this nation has. The only problem is that if I, it doesn't, if I say something and it doesn't go in favor of party B, then I belong to party A. If it doesn't go in favor of party A, then I belong to party B. But that is fine. It means that we are being neutral. We're doing the work that is expected of us. But we will plead with Ghanaians that peace is not something that a group of people alone can do so. It is the Peace Council's responsibility to help us, educate us, and to make all of us peacemaking people so that we will be able to live in peace in this country, in harmony, that will bring development and that will ensure that, you know, our nation goes forward the way we expect it to be. Prof, I've heard from some colleague pastors that mm. you are too political. With this uh, uh, peace council, thing, you are not spiritual. Mm. Are you spiritual? <laughs> Spirituality, what does spirituality mean? You are always on politics. Yeah. You are always going there, NDC, MPP, closed door meeting. Yeah. You know, yes. so it's always politics, politics. And there are those who want to believe that pastors like you are not spiritual. And therefore, there are young pastors who see people like you, that if you want to prove you are highly anointed, mm. you are full of the Holy Spirit. They are not Professor Sante. Well, that is fine. But let's look at, you know, those who have taken time to study the Bible. Were the prophets, the, the classical prophets in the Bible, would you call them, you know, spiritual? Because these were people who took authorities to task. That's why we say that we have a prophetic mi mission. Now, just imagine what Amos, Micah, Jeremiah, Isaiah. Isaiah, Isaiah was a court prophet. People who challenged authorities, who drew people's attention to the values of a nation. Were they spiritual? Spirituality that is devoid of concern for the well-being of this nation, for me, is a sham. If your spirituality is high down and it has no perpendicular dimensions or horizontal dimension, then that spirituality is questionable. After all, what is it that the Lord has called us to be? What, how does he describe the church? the salt of the earth and the light of this world. And what is the meaning of this, of, of salt? Preservation of, of, of society, flavor to the society, light, illumination, drawing people's attention to the, to the ethical norms that we should go by. If you claim to be a spiritual person and your spirituality is to withdraw from society, then you have not understood what spirituality is all about. By all means, let us 
be spiritual. Let us have that I thou, I and God relationship. But the I thou relationship must have horizontal implications. The Lord said, I was sick, you took care of me. And he said, when did we find you sick? And we took care of you. Said, As you did it for your brother, you did it for me. And this nation, we don't need people to tell us that we as Christians should be concerned about this nation that God has given us. If people are doing things that will not help push the nation forward, it is for Christians we have the prophetic responsibility to draw attention, people's attention to this. And let me take this opportunity to say to our politicians, those who think that Christians and religious people, all that we have to do is to pray for the nation, but we have nothing to say. We have a stake in this nation. Christianity or religion has a perspective in the development of our nation, and we must ensure that we have it. It's not everybody who has that capacity to do so. Fine. If you don't have the capacity to do so, that is fine. But Christians who have the capacity to be engaged in the development of the nation, in the economic issues, in the political issues of the nation, should not be gagged. We have the mm -hmm. responsibility to be the salt and the light of this world. Viewers, I'm in conversation with Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante, the chairman of the National Peace Council. This is what is next. And today he is calling every Ghanaian to show concern as far as our national development is concerned, especially the various religious groups, churches, Christian leaders, Muslim, that fine, if you don't have capacity, but we have been called to show concern as far as our national development is concerned, whether it's a matter of politics, economics, whatever it is, we must show interest and much concern. This is the only country that we have. Prof, sometimes I hear Ghanaians are peace-loving. Hmm. Another time I also see levels of violence, destruction. Hmm. You are the chairman of the National Peace Council. Who are we? Are we peace-loving people or bloodthirsty people? Well, I wouldn't say that we are bloodthirsty people. Neither would I say that we are so peace-loving that we can simply sit back and um, say we are peaceful. So there's no such a thing as violence uh, amongst us. I think relatively speaking when people say that we are peace loving we are comparing ourselves to the nations around us um, by the grace of god we haven't seen violence to the measure that we have seen in the neighboring countries but that doesn't mean that there is no violence in in this country we're doing ourselves a lot of violence you know um, land issues chieftaincy disputes in the north we see all these things. When we talk about violence, we, there's, there's a lot of violence. Now we're talking about kidnappings and all sorts of things happening in this country. So we cannot sit and fold our arms and say that, oh, we are okay. We need to do something about the situation that we find ourselves in and do the best that we can to ensure that these things that um, seem to be undermining the peace that we have in our country, the violent situations, inter intra ethnic wars in the north, the chieftaincy disputes, land issues, and, and those kinds of things that seem to be undermining our peace, we do something about it. We should respect the institutions we have put in place. After all, what is politics about? You know, I mean, the contractarian thesis, I mean, people who have written that, Thomas Hobbes, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, John Locke, and others will tell you that, you know, um, we created, um, we instituted politics so that we will not live in a state of nature. In a state of nature, where everybody thinks that they are in control of themselves. They are not under anybody. What you have is that we have chaos. Life is brutish and short. That's what, you know, Hobbes will tell us. And indeed, 
That is the situation. That's why we have been able to put in place institutions. We have the courts who are there to ensure justice in the system. We have the security agencies, the police, and other agencies in place. In this country, we have the Shraj in place, serving as ombudsman in, 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 in the country. We have other institutions. There is a peace council. We have our churches. We have our traditional rulers and all that. We are under the rule of law. That's what we have opted for. Constitutional rule. That's what we say. So we should allow institutions to function. If I'm not happy with something that is going on, I don't take the laws into my own hands. I can challenge what is going on. If the government is doing something and I'm not happy about it and it's against the laws of the land, you have every right to challenge that by taking matters to court. And the court also has the responsibility to ensure that, you know, justice prevails so that there will be peace in our country but we put institutions in place and we don't even trust the institutions we have been able to put in place there is a electoral commission to handle issues we are always suspicious of that commission that we have been able to put in place and once we begin to mistrust the institutions that we have put in place what happens so, as far as I'm concerned, if we will be able to live as a peaceful nation, the way we tout ourselves as peaceful, then we must also respect the institutions that we have been able to put in place to ensure that we do not live in a state of nature. The institutions that are there to make sure somebody is driving, red light is on, and he's just moving on. How would you say that you are living in, in a peaceful nation? How would you talk about peace when you yourself, you're not going by the rules that will ensure peace in the nation? So let us be law abiding. Let us be people who respect the institutions we have been able to put in place to facilitate the peace and development of an, our nation. And let those who have been put in charge of these institutions also do the work that has been entrusted in, that we have entrusted into their hands. Government is in place because we have contracted that. It's a social contract. We said we cannot, I cannot own my power. I cannot, you cannot own your power. You cannot own your authority. So let us all cede it to a giving group that we have put in place to govern us. They should respect us and do what, you know, we have asked them to do. Prof, depending on who is in power, there's this perception that institutions are not independent, they are politicized. Who, but who has it politicized the institutions? We have politicized the institutions. We have politicized the institutions. The institutions are put in place and there are laws governing their functions. But if I want them to ignore the laws all of us have put in place to govern their functions and please me, because I'm in power or I'm in opposition, then we are undermining the very institutions we have put in place to ensure that we live in peace. So we should stop politicizing our institutions and allow the institutions to function. And those who have been put in place there should also know that they have been put in place there to facilitate the peace of the nation. They, if they are interested in politics, they should leave those institutions and go and do politics. Prof, now, uh, in fact, just last Sunday, the Presby moderator raised this issue, mm. the politicization of almost anything, everything. Mm. And you are calling this nation that we must depoliticize. Where do we start from? Well, I start from myself. And you must start from yourself as an individual, whoever is listening to us understand that we do not have we are all political animals by all means i mean it will it will be impossible for us to say that we are not interested in politics then we are not interested in the governance of our nation the management of our nation but we must understand what politics is also all about we must understand that as part of that we have 
been able to put in place institutions to facilitate good governance. We should hold them responsible if they are not doing what is expected of them to ensure good governance. But we should not expect them to undermine the laws that are of the mandate that they have been giving and do our policies for us. Once we do that, we should not expect our institutions to function. And that's the reason why we don't put somebody in a position just because that person belongs to your party or that person voted for you. If the person has the qualifications and he has what it takes to do so and he is going to govern, he is going to do the job on the basis of the rules and the mandate that has been given, fine. But we have no right undermining the very institutions that we have, been, we have put in place by politicizing them and expect them to function the way they ought to. We are in a conversation with Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante, the chairman of the National Peace Council. This is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of this nation. Prof, I hear hate speech in this country. Hmm. And sometimes they are coming from responsible, supposedly responsible people. Hmm. People in high places, in government, media, traditional leaders, and sometimes surprisingly, even pastors. Mm. Now, we do all these things, and it's like somebody else must come and clean the room, the debt we have created. Mm. How do we get people, those in government, those in opposition, our media, traditional leaders, and even now pastors, mm. to accept the issues you are raising for us that matters of peace are collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. Nobody should stand somewhere, create problem, and then you think there's a National Peace Council, a big, uh, uh, a giant somewhere, who should come and clean your debt? Mm -hmm. well, my brother, Reverend Doctor, you know, you have said it. To be honest, to me, this is not a question, but it's, 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 it's a statement that you are making. We, we need to sit back and ask ourselves, who am I? I am a pastor. What is my role? What is my responsibility as a pastor in the nation? What contribution do I have to make? If I am a person in a position of authority, I am the traditional ruler. Who is a traditional ruler? I think from time to time we need to ask ourselves, what makes me a chief? It is people who have given me that responsibility. It is people who have ceded that power. They have ceded their own power. I'm in contract with the people. For what? To do, to politicize the situation, to use bad language that will set, you know, them fighting and that will even set example to the young ones. If I have been elected into a political office, what is my role? What is my responsibility? I think it is important for, for me, Emmanuel Asante, a pastor, the chairman of the National Peace Council, to ask myself, who am I? What have I been asked to do? And if I'm speaking, how do I speak? I think we should be mindful of the things that we say. And I'm glad that you are raising this issue, especially we are getting closer to the elections. You will find people mounting political platforms and saying all sorts of things. And when they have said that, they sit somewhere and say, where's the Peace Council? I think it is wrong. We have the responsibility to be decorous in the way we speak in the things that we say. It is not everything that you should stand in public and even say it, no matter how true that, that truthful that thing may be. And so let me, let me, um, we are talking about this, hate speech, bad language. Anybody who has been truly socialized, if you have been brought up in a home, you know that you have to be mindful of the things that you say in public. If 
if I said something against you and it will hurt you, don't say the same thing to somebody. What you expect others to do unto you, do it also unto them. Prof, we are getting to 2020 election as you mentioned. Hmm. This election, we are going to have two presidents, one sitting, one former president, who may contest the first ever, if it happens like that, we've never had two people who have ever been our president going around campaigning. We've never seen that in the political history of this country. Next year's election will be the first election that the current chairperson of the Electoral Commission is going to supervise. Mm -hmm. Next year's election will be the first election after the vigilante bill. How do we reposition ourselves for 2020? I think it is important for us to ask ourselves, I mean, we are vying for power for what? So that, you know, people will see us as people in power, or is it for the good of the nation? Why are people competing for the leadership of this nation? To lead us to do what? Are they competing for the leadership of this nation for their own good or is it for the good of the nation? I think it is important for our leaders to ask themselves these questions. I have always said, when after election, politicians go to the church and to our mosque to say they're going to give thanks to God, are they giving thanks to God because of the responsibilities God has placed on them to take care of the nation and are they doing so because they are willing to be the servants of the people or are they going to give thanks to God because they think they have been put in a certain position where they can amass wealth and undermine the well-being of the people above whom they have been placed to, to take care of. I think once we begin to ask ourselves these questions we will be very careful the way we go about campaigning, the way we go about doing our work. Let every one of us ask themselves. Let me ask myself, if I'm vying for a parliamentary seat, if I'm vying for the, the leadership of this nation, why am I doing that? Jesus said, I'm among you as one who says, the Son of Man came to be ministered unto, but not to be, to, to, to minister to, but not to be ministered unto. Leadership, servant leadership. And if you're going to beg people to give you opportunity to serve them, you don't go there to insult. You don't go there to undermine them. When you go to the chapel to give praise and thanks to this leader, for God so loved the world that he gave, and you have offered yourself to give to the nation, then you go there to ask for strength and power to be able to deliver as a servant of the people. People who are vying for power and because of that are saying all sorts of things, insulting from left and right, and saying dirty things about the others. Ask yourselves, why are you seeking power? To do what? Is it because of what you will get? When, after you have won, when you wear that white clothes and you go to church, do you go there to ask for permission for God to grant you strength to serve? Or do you go there because you think you've been given the opportunity to amass wealth? Let us talk about servant leadership in this country. And let us reflect on that. Once we did that, I believe it will help all of us. The recent elections we have had, Prof., especially under the Fourth Republic, any election comes with tension hmm. and fear hmm. as if this country is going to break. Will mm -hmm. 2020 be different? I have said Ghana will not burn. One, Ghana belongs to God. And for the sake of God, God lives. He will protect his own people. His people will seek him. And God will protect his own people. But let me also say to those people who continue to threaten, we will do this, we will do that. 
if Ghana burns, their relatives will also burn. And I don't think we are here to do that. In the first place, Ghana will not burn. Ghana will stand because God is on the side of his people. And the same people in this land will not allow Ghana to burn. Very assuring. We are getting ready for 2020. And the man of God tells this nation, we will go through 2020. Ghana will not burn. And if you are hatching any plan anywhere, have this in mind as he has said that. Ghana will not burn. But if Ghana burns, your relatives and the people who are dear to you equally will also be burned. However, the God of this country will hold us together. Ghana will not burn. But Prof, there are people who fail us. Sometimes the security agencies, mm. the recent Ayawaso thing, you saw people who were supposed to protect. Mm. When somebody was slapped, you find a security person who gently walk away. Mm. Sometimes people create violence mm. in the face of security and other, you know, and they all close their eyes. Mm. There are institutions that are supposed to work for us who are working against us. Mm. And what do we do? Well, this is what we were saying, that if I have been placed there for the security of this nation, then I need to ask myself, what is my responsibility? What must I do? Um, have I been put in place, trained, given all those gadgets? For have, have I been given those gadgets to use against the very people who have given me that to protect them? I think it is important for our security people to understand that they are not there against the people, but they are there for the people. They are not there for a particular individual, party, or government, but they are there for Ghanaians. And we should, we should, we should say to ourselves that that very thing you did, you have been given that authority. We've given you the training that you need, and you are using that against me who has who has given you that authority that power and i'm talking about the entire Ghanaians who have given you that you're using it against me sit back and ask yourself is it my responsibility to molest the people or is it my responsibility to protect the people let me say to our security agents for me i'm speaking from not just from the perspective of one who is concerned about the peace of this nation. But I'm also speaking from the perspective of one who believes that God has called us and has entrusted us with responsibilities. We will give account of whatever God has asked us to do before him one day. You are a security agent. Ask yourself when you appear before God and he asks you, what kind of account are you going to give in respect of the way you have functioned? We have the responsibility as Ghanaians to ensure the peace and the security of our nation. And we should do so irrespective of what party color we wear. We are not there to protect just our party members. We're not there just to protect certain people who put us there. But we are there to protect Ghanaians and to ensure the peace of Mother Ghana. The peace of Ghana will be your peace and it, the prosperity of Ghana will be your prosperity. Prof, help us here. It's like our contemporary politicians have learned that if you can go into the communities and give them mobile phone, give them bags of cement, iron sheet, they will vote for you. Mm. And it's like our people are not so issue based so just go there if you are handsome, if you know how to, you, you win election. Mm. How do we bring election from the realm of fear mm. to make election issue based? Because like all, all the prayers we pray, close to election, that God help us so that we don't fight, we don't want bloodshed. But how do we move people from that realm of fear? Now that go vote, but be issue based, mm. be discerning. You see, Reverend, this is why we 
you and I were saying that for those who think that spirituality simply means I, God, I should simply be praying and fasting and all that, do not understand what spirituality is all about. We are living in a country where the majority of us belong to one region, religion or another, one denomination or another. If we, our pulpits would be used to educate our people, to open our eyes, to practice public Christianity, public Islamic faith. What do I mean by that? Public Christianity means that my commitment to the Lord must also have something to do with the way I, I do things publicly. If we are going to be educating our people and helping them to open their minds, not to sell their conscience for mobile phones, for buckets, for material things, just for material things, but to, to look at the types of people who have come to us to ask us to vote for them, to raise questions in terms of who they are, what messages do they have, apart from simply giving us money, dishing things out, and we will begin to interrogate such things. We will teach our people to, to see things from that angle. I think we will be doing a lot of work. But you know what we do? We will be blaming the NCC. The NCC is not educating the people. Oh, they should be here. How many of them? But if all of us, the men of God, whether Christians or Muslims, will use our platforms, our pulpits, our whatever we are using, to educate church members and to help people to realize what it means to be Christians, to be salt of this earth, and to begin to question, not to sell our consciences for pittance. If we will be doing that from the, from the pulpits, and we will not think that in doing that I'm doing politics, and will not allow people to cajole us and to say all sorts of things to us that he's doing politics, but we'll be able to tell them that the Bible teaches us this way, I think we will be able to do a lot for this nation. Prof, will this vigilante bill work? The vigilante bill will work if we will abide by the law and if those who are there to maintain the law will also maintain the law and if those who break the law will also be dealt with according to the law. You see, you can make a law, but if the people do not abide by the law, they will break it. And if the people who are responsible to ensure that the law, if is, is, is broken, sanctions are given, such people will take action, it will be fine. If they take action, the police can only prosecute, take people to that place, if those whom we have given authority to take care of us will allow the law to work, it will work. So if the vigilante bill is going to work, it depends upon our political parties and the leadership. And I believe that if we are committed to it, it will work. If I as a reverend minister will not go and plead for a church member who has broken the law, it will work. If the chief will not go to plead for his son or native who has broken the law, the law will work. If the politician will not say this is our man, it will work. If the policeman will say, I will go by the rules and even if though you threaten me, I am prepared to suffer for doing the right thing, it will work. Prof, this is what is next. Mm -hmm. Your last word for my viewers. My last word for Ghanaians is that do not let us listen to these things and not do anything about it. The purpose of programs of this nature is to educate you, is to challenge you to know that God has given us Ghana. It is our country. We have nowhere else to go 
and we should not allow people to destroy this nation for us and for our forebears and for those who will come after us. You and I have the responsibility to ensure that Ghana moves on, Ghana develops in peace and in harmony. Viewers, I've been in conversation with Most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. How do I wish we can continue and continue? But this is where time will allow us. And this evening, he has raised some important issues for us to consider. This is what is next. We'll come your way, God willing, next week. Till then, the hallmark must be the common good. This is GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. God bless our homeland Ghana and make this country great and strong. See you next week. <laughs>